I wanted to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Manuel, Manuel Vexler. <clears throat> He's an accomplished technology educator and business leader in the telecommunications and IT industry. He has a focus on sustainability, ESG, and digital transformation. He currently serves as the executive director for the Actionable Knowledge Foundational Institute and also serves as a Cornell University facilitator. He has a very long and impressive bio of where he's been and what he's done, and I'll let you read that on your own time. But his educational background includes um, master's in electrical engineering, a network engineering and management certificate from the University of Toronto, <clears throat> executive marketing certificate from Queen's University, <clears throat> and he's a bit of an overachiever. He's got three certificates from Cornell University, one of which is in systems thinking, digital transformation, and entrepreneurship. So without further delay, I am going to welcome you, Manuel, and uh, let you take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. And I shall add, or I shall start by saying that I'm actually on the road to transform myself uh, from a system engineer to a system thinker. So thank you for the Cornell certificate and I'll keep learning. Excellent. So I will uh, start. Uh, do I need to share my screen? You need to share your screen. I can tell you when it's showing up. Yep, you just have to hit play, I guess. So it's, there you go. You're all set. We're on. And again, thank you, Laura. And thank you, Derek, for, for the invitation. And thank you, Elena, for responding to my numerous emails and questions and so on. And uh, we'll talk for about 30 minutes about the uh, sustainability and system thinking. Uh, I have to warn you that most of my slides are just pictures. So uh, it will give you a lot of space to think on yourself as we go through that. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is really, to me, it's one of the most wicked and complex challenges for all which is really developing a sustainable ecosystem, sustainable and ESG compliant ecosystem. That means a system, a system where uh, not only companies are uh, held uh, accountable and they have to do the strategic planning for sustainability, but also they are uh, held accountable and uh, they, uh, in, your, in the Europe now they are even liable for the ESG compliance of their supply chain. So it's a huge problem. And no, I'm not going to address it all today uh, because we'll take uh, the whole two days and plus of the, of the uh, forum. But I'm going to take a, a shortcut uh, and I'm going to think about electric vehicles and uh, their um, impact on sustainability. And I'm going to use uh, DSRP as the tool and the toolkit and the tool set and the way of, of approaching electric vehicles as one key representative really of the sustainability movement, uh, at least in the developed world. I shall mention here there are many other perspectives we can take. We can take an agriculture, we can take a whole transportation perspective, but I choose that because of uh, the capability to run some illustrations and go through the DSRP process uh, in general. So uh, many times we start to talk about sustainability and DSG without really paying too much attention to uh, what is the uh, what is the taxonomy for for these terms and. I came up with uh, uh, a simple definition. And again, looking at the distinction between CDSRP, of course, distinction between what uh, sustainability is and ESG is. So you should think about sustainability, about uh, business and what the business is doing in terms of uh, continuing to operate. Fairly simple, just staying in business. Uh, and this, of course, has to factor in not only the uh, operations of the business on a day-to-day -day basis, but also the strategy, the three years out, the five years out, the 10 years out, 
even the 30 years out on how the business will survive. Uh, it is also referred as the triple bottom line, and you'll hear me talking about this a couple of times during the presentation. It uh, also stands for people, planet, and profits. So you can see that the ecosystem is really huge. It really covers everything we know, we can see, or we can experience in our lives. Now, ESG, it's a business report. And many times uh, we uh, cross the distinction line between ESG and sustainability. But for, for today's talk, I'm going to stick with sustainability and ESG as separate entities. And I'm going to treat the ESG as a business report, as a way to report. A very complex report, a very comprehensive report about the business, nevertheless a report. So a little bit more about sustainability and uh, ESG. And yes, it's not a type uh, sustainability. If you're looking at the etymology of the world, it's coming from the sustainability. It's building abilities. It's being, building capabilities. Capabilities to sustain the business. Capabilities to sustain life. Capabilities to sustain personal and uh, collective or group uh, objectives. And so I just said it, it's a broad concept. And it's a broad concept and uh, we should take a system approach because of the complexity we are facing when we're looking at uh, sustainability. ESG, as I mentioned before, it's a framework. It's a set of uh, reports. Um, they get rolled up and uh, there are agencies that are uh, looking at the reports and provide uh, ratings the same way or ratings the same way it does financial report. So sustainability and DSG are clearly separated and we should keep them separated, not only in today's discussion, but in general. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end about this in more details. Uh, I promise that most of my slides are graphical, but here it's an introduction to DSRP, not that we need it. Uh, and um, I will again say that this was also an important topic of my uh, certificate in system thinking. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Derek, uh, for, for uh, this class, for classes, actually. Uh, and now uh, I'm not going to scare you because I'm not going to go through the model, but I thought that it's important to remind you that there is a mathematical model and representation that you can see on the right hand side. What you see on the left hand side of the slide is really an iterative process, uh, a constant and growing iterative process between our mental models and using our perceptions of the real world, collecting information, distilling this information, and as the DSRP uh, methodology says, distilling it in uh, using a uh, part and, and whole process, constantly going between the real world that provides us with feedback or uh, fairly soon actually, the real world will be also joined by the virtual world already halfway there, and our mental models. And we see the DSRP, uh, how it, it uh, helps us to make sense and organize information and make sense, create meaning, create uh, actions and reactions on our part. So let's uh, dive right in and look at the uh, DSRP uh, in the context of electric vehicles and uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. I'll use the ICE term, but uh, these are the cars that we all know and you can see on the roads, car trucks and so on. Uh, it's a almost uh, 150 years old technology, maybe more in terms of in invention, uh, 1908, it was, I think, the first year that was produced in mass uh, by Ford. 
what you see on the left hand side it's a very different physics and this is the distinction we, we we can start with the basic elements and we have a different physics we have the physics of electromagnetics uh the subject of electrical engineering and electronic engineering and uh, computer sciences on the right hand side we see the the science of thermodynamics the physics of thermodynamics which lead to uh, uh, mechanical engineers and, and a, a lot of uh, other disciplines which are related to mechanical technologies and, and uh, uh, it, for, for a, an electrical engineer or electronic engineer like myself the distinction cannot be more clearer but let's take it a little bit more apart and let's look at these parts because we're going to look at them uh, in each step of the uh, DSRT so what you see on the left hand side is the source of energy uh, one mark is a red uh, dot and you can see that uh, most of our electricity uh, is coming from uh, fossil fuels uh, but some of them and if you can see in the background uh, wind and solar are taking uh, um, starting to take a, a role in the supply of electricity um what you also see here is uh, the electricity gets uh, uh produced in, in electrical plants we know that and eventually it gets delivered to a uh, powering station for the electric vehicle uh, another important part of the electric vehicle is of course the engine and the battery set so if we look at the, the electricity this is where it's stored um, and another very important part, and this is almost orthogonal to the development of electric vehicles, is the uh, uh, emergence of uh, use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, broad use of artificial intelligence inside the cars. I'm not going to go too much on the right hand side, because what you see there really is uh, we uh, operate. Uh, in, in the case of internal combustion engine cars, we operate exclusively with uh, fossil fuels. We need refineries instead of power plants. Uh, we have gas stations for distribution. We have fuel tanks on the car, and we have uh, mechanical engines to uh, transform the uh, electrochemical process uh, of uh, burning burning fuel into mechanical forces, which is the energy. So uh, going to the uh, systems approach, um, I started to mention them already, but just for clarity, we talk about charging and charging station. We're talking about electricity in the form of an electric motor or electric motors. Uh, and uh, also we talk about the battery and the autopilot and i'll talk more about these systems and their relations in the next slides and in uh, the perspectives we're taking on them but to be noticed here uh, you can see a, a, a fairly strong technological element and innovation element in the form of artificial intelligence and the autopilot moving on with our DSRP analysis. Uh, okay, if my computer wants to collaborate. Uh, I marked in blue, uh, I look at it as, as a two level um, relations. One set of relations are an informational plane uh, between the AI system and different parts of the, uh, of the electric vehicle. And also I'm looking at an energy plane, which is marked in green. So let's start with the energy. Uh, not, uh, not a big secret that the uh, cars need to be plugged in to, to get the power. Power gets stored in the battery and the, from the battery gets distributed to the rest of the car. Uh, specifically, a lot of the power goes into the um, electrical engine uh and uh, uh some power is also used for the uh, ai and uh, the um, 
uh, self-driving mechanism or assisted driving mechanism. Uh, what we see in blue, however, is it's another plane, and this is the information plane. And you'll be um, it'll be very interesting to see that the car actually is, let's call it aware information about the environment. It talks to the power uh, the power station. For instance, if you drive an electric car, it knows if the power stations are available or not, and directs a, a car to the proper power station and um, in, in order to reduce the weight. So it distributes uh, it distributes actually the load on the power stations and the on car AI is aware of that. Another way to look at the um, information, it's also collecting and uh, completely uh, collecting information about the state of the battery, how much charge you have estimated, how long you can drive. Uh, it also talks to the uh, electric engine. Uh, and I should mention here that actually the car has, and the electric cars has, um, they are much more efficient because they can take the braking mechanism and generate electricity and recharge the battery. So it's a more efficient uh, system overall. But the information plane sits on top of all the activities of the car and interacts with the human in the form of um, in the form of uh, self-driving or driving assist. And moving on again. Now, uh, if we take a perspective on the, uh, um, and I, I already mentioned when, when starting to look at the relations, there are two planes, is the intelligence and the control logic represented by the artificial intelligence. Uh, and it is the power and locomotion, which practically does what cars know to do, which is to, to be driven to, to go around. So to summarize, we look at the car from a DSRP perspective. We break it down in, uh, we, we first create a distinction with the, uh, what we called ICE, the internal combustion engine powered cars. We also look at the systems that are the main components and we see them here. We took a relationship and we look at the relationship from an intelligence and power and finally, we took the two perspectives and separate them so we are clear where we are. And again, the separation doesn't mean that we can think about them just in simple separation. We have to also constantly go back and forth between uh, uh, the, the point of view and uh, how, how the car really operates. So a couple of summaries, okay. The um, cars are all electrical and they, at least most of them rely solely on batteries to provide the energy they store in, uh, there, there are the mechanisms to, to power the car. AI became a key technology, uh, but what is not? Uh, it's not changing how electrical energy is produced. Remember, the electrical energy is produced still mainly from fossil fuels. Uh, and also it doesn't change the way the roads are and what really the parts of, our, uh, of a car are. It still has a body, has uh, wheels, has metal parts uh, for, uh, for the wheels and for the uh, transmission and so on. Uh, and uh, we, if we take a system approach, we talked about uh, the car in car management. We also talked about the mobility, the electric motors, and the energy recovery. We also talked about the charging station and the relationship with the batteries. Um, and we'll look in the total system, it's looking and behaving as a car. So it didn't really change the. Um, fundamental view of the system. We, we, we see a, an electric vehicle or we see an ice vehicle, we recognize immediately it's a car and, and we use it as a car.
So continuing the DSRP, uh, if you look at the relationships, we established the relationship between the information uh, and management system. We call it artificial intelligence generically and uh, the electric power system that uh, that uh, provides uh, the energy and moves the car uh, here i'm actually stopping and turning to a different perspective and this is the beauty of the srp it allows me to um, to switch from one perspective to another and Although you expected that I'll take the perspective of a car, I'm actually taking the perspective of sustainability. And this is the rest of my presentation. I changed totally the perspective from looking at the uh, cars, electric vehicles, and the uh, internal combustion engine to a perspective of uh, uh, sustainability. And just as a reminder, I define sustainability as what the uh, what a business does is, is all about the operations of the business. It's about the strategy. It's about the tactics. It's about the groups that compose a business. Also, uh, when you take a sustainability perspective, we step back from the pure business operation as a single entity, and we start to look at the supply chain. We look at the impact on people. We also call them stakeholders. We look at the impact on the environment and the planet. And we still have to keep the essential fundamental reason a business exists, uh, which is to, to provide uh, profits in, uh, to, to uh, shareholders, but not compromising uh, on the people and the planet in doing so. So, I mentioned already, but sustainability is about the planet, the people, and the profitability. And I'll stop here for a second uh, with a sidebar comment, and I'll just mention that actually many times students and the students in uh, eCornell come back and say, well, sustainability is not profitable. It's a cost center. Uh, companies are taking a dim approach, especially the, the finance part of the companies, the financial groups inside the company, uh, the CFO, uh, on the profitability. So they consider it the cost of doing business. Uh, I would strongly argue that this is the wrong uh, mindset, is the wrong uh, approach, is the wrong relation, is the wrong perspective on the business. Uh, sustainability is about profitability and uh, uh, sustainability is about creating the right environment for people and also taking care of the environment. So going back to the SRP, we'll take a planet perspective and we'll go very quickly through those. But if you look at a planet perspective, looking at the electric vehicles, the first part of the presentation, we see still the sources of energies are primarily oil and gas, and to some level, uh, a uh, move toward renewable. I'll talk a little bit more and provide some statistics toward the end. Uh, it also a discussion about uh, carbon footprint, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, we also, uh, coming in the case of electric vehicles, we say much larger, larger content of minerals, lithium, nickel, carbon, and all these are component, main components of the batteries, and I'll show a little bit more statistics later. So when you take a planet perspective, we can notice some changes, but we also notice that a lot of uh, the, uh, let's say, call it the second level, uh, relations with the environment are still unchanged, even if we introduce the electric vehicle. So taking the, uh, the planet and the carbon footprint electricity uh, perspective, what you see on the left-hand side, it's actually uh, the uh, greenhouse gases emission, the CO2 emissions primarily, and uh, really, what electric vehicles uh, can do is to move 
some of the uh, sources of energies from um, uh, from oil and gas from from uh, 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 the use of uh, uh, of uh, renewable to to the use of renewable in the form of electricity production. It also they, they uh, emit less carbon footprint. Uh, the statistics show in every country uh, how much they uh, how much impact they have, uh, and uh, overall uh, the uh, uh, electric vehicles are considered to reduce carbon footprint by about a factor of uh, three hundred percent or a factor of three. But to remember from this slide, uh, the introduction of electrical vehicles doesn't mean automatically the introduction of uh, uh, renewable energy. These are almost like two separate uh, planes if we want to make a distinction there. Uh, and if we take a 200 years perspective on electricity, uh, electricity production still at the global level it's only 17% of the total energy we produce in, produced in 2021. It's actually uh, coming from renewables. And we introduce in, we were including renewables, not only the wind and solars that we know so much about it, but also the, uh, the, the use of uh, the hydropower. So only about 70%, it's, uh, it's really, uh, the, the, the total amount actually uh, for a good measure is throwing also the nuclear power is renewable. That, that's a different discussion altogether. But to remember, uh, a lot of energy still produces fossil fuels. So let's take a battery perspective. Remember the DSRP applied to the electric vehicles. And if you look at the batteries, the batteries are really a major source of, uh, uh, of intense use of minerals, graphite, aluminum, nickel, copper, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, in, in large quantities. Uh, graphite, uh, which is really a form uh, of coal, uh, and it's, it's produced still in coal mines in, in some quantities. Uh, it's almost 30% of the uh, total mass of the battery, the total weight of the battery. So uh, batteries are still a key problem. And this is actually a problem, uh, if you can call it an unintended consequence of introducing electric vehicles on a massive scale. When I did the research, I also came up with something that um, comes out of, if you want, of mindfulness. Uh, people have, have the capability to innovate. So we have this cycle where we look at the reality and we create our mind models. But then out of this cycle is we take our mind models and we try to correct reality, right? The feedback loop to reality. So we are not a passive observer of reality when we think of the SRP. We are an active, uh, at least to some levels, and I'll leave this to a discussion after the presentation on to what level we, we participate in this feedback loop. Taking a people perspective and going a little bit faster, although I have to do justice to uh, the, uh, the models, you know, the human, the, the the, uh, uh, the role of humans in uh, sustainability. We talk about diversity and inclusion. We talk about disruptive innovation, as I mentioned. We should look at the drivers of uh, the electric vehicles and their experience and safety. And last but not least about the human as an individual player and as an individual actor. Going quickly here, major disruption came out of the electric vehicles. I mentioned the systems are mechanical, so 170,000 jobs may be lost in the transition to, uh, from, to electric vehicles from ICE. Uh, hopefully economies are right and more jobs will be created for electrical engineers. From a personal experience, I can tell you that it takes 
um, about 20 years, uh, 22, 24 years for a person to become an electric engineer. So it's not something that will happen overnight. Another uh, element to look at the, uh, the EVs and uh, the impact on, and on the workers, uh, on the stakeholders, damage speaks for, his, for itself. These are kids actually that are uh, collecting lithium, mine, lithium in Congo. And there are millions and millions of people, uh, poor people that suffer from this transformation of, uh, uh, to, to, or migration to electric vehicles from the change of technology in use of batteries. Uh, on the positive side, the driver sa safety and experience is enhanced by uh, the use of AI. Uh, we are at a point where drivers can be significantly assist, assisted in, uh, 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 in, in the, on, on their uh, commute by these systems. Um, I'm not going to read the chart, but it, uh, there are a number of features which are safety features like uh, uh, safe uh, uh, lane change, for instance. Uh, also makes the driver aware in case if uh, she or he uh, loses attention or fails a uh, Homo economicus, this is another slide that can lead to an hour or two of discussions, but uh, uh, looking at the electric vehicles and their impact, and uh, I'm taking a broad picture going back to, to ESG, uh, there are about 35, 36 billion, trillions of dollars which are allocated to ESG. So we see a false shift into the allocations of funds that partially are also uh, benefiting the electric vehicles. So final distinctions. Uh, the previous speakers talked a lot about not making a, a clear cut between um, you know, binary statement. Um, I would say that uh, is uh, is a person in transition from being a, a, a um, uh, an, an engineer to a system thinker. I still think in binary terms, and this is what you see here: uh, positive impact, reduce CO two emissions, driver safety. This is really a recap of what we talked about it. Uh, good, uh, you know, good uh, if you are an IT or a computer program or an electrical uh, technician or engineer. Um, improves the use of renewables and innovation is open. And, and uh, this is an important factor. This is one of the aha moments for me. Uh, negative impact. We saw the pictures of mineral exploitation. Uh, uh, people are overdoing the self-driving. Uh, unfortunately, people lost their lives uh, trusting the car too much. Uh, mechanical employees are uh, affected. Uh, again, the working conditions for the poor uh, are not getting better. And uh, uh, as I'm going to show soon, that there is uh, uh, not enough risk taking in ESG innovation. So, if you look at uh, this slide, they actually, uh, and, and I missed it um, to, to explain it, but if you look here in uh, um, in uh, red, uh, you can uh, or magenta, you see the uh, most of the executives put the funds in retrofitting current uh, products to become ESG compliant instead of innovating and allocating funds to make, to, to rethink the whole process as I started this conversation about uh, making really sustainability profitable, started as a profit center. So what we learned, uh, really DSRP provided a mindful approach uh, and uh, uh, can help us to look at the unintended consequences. We talked about batteries, for instance. We talked about the impact on the environment in general, the impact also on the uh, workforce. Uh, and the conclusion is really, and the conclusion that uh, sort of, and again, I'm going to leave it to the audience, uh, 
The SR period really led me to uh, understand better and deeper the emerging property of uh, humans as innovators. So that loop, it's a constant evolving loop and innovation is part of the ESRP loop. To conclude here, thank you very much. And uh, if you have questions, here is my email address. I'm, uh, as Laura kindly said, uh, I'm also part uh, or, or uh, I'm directing the Actionable Knowledge Foundational Institute, which is a nonprofit for uh, digital transformation and sustainability. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> that was a fascinating talk. And um, I really love it when people structure talks around a really concrete example of applying DSRP to a real world thing. I think it really helps people build an understanding of not only what systems thinking is, but the value of it, just seeing one concrete example straight through. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to give you some of them and, and see uh, how far we can get through them. But now that everybody has your email, they can ask you directly to the ones that I don't get to. Uh, I think there were a couple of questions in in from the audience that really were um, wanting to hear from you a little bit more on the value of looking at this issue from conceptual perspectives, like you had the perspective of batteries, the perspective of innovation. What was the benefit to you and your colleagues in sort of going through that exercise? Well, everything starts in our minds, does it? Mm -hmm. And really, you know, changing, if you want, uh, changing our patterns of thinking is probably the most difficult human thing. And if you look at my white, white hair, uh, it actually tells you that it becomes more difficult to say it, right? We, we sort of not learn, and I know you are an expert in learning. I'm not trying to even go there, Laura. <laughs> but uh, we, we learn differently at different uh, phases of our lives. And, and that really, this exercise helped me to change my perspective on EVs because I was, um, so far I was just reading the news and, you know, the uh, excellent marketing spins on, on EVs. So taking this perspective, yeah. you know, analyzing and synthesizing at the same time, it, it's a painful, but use, very useful exercise. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we talk a lot about is, you know, it's very easy for us as humans to take anthropomorphic perspectives, you know, things with eyeballs, but that to really understand the structure of systems that doing what you just did looking at these systems from conceptual perspectives will help you to see more, um, have a better understanding of a system in and of itself, which is clear from your presentation on, on EVs that you, you really went through it very methodically. And I thank you for that personally. And I know the audience uh, appreciated. Another thing that people have been asking me about, I think some key phrases that you said that people wanted you to talk a little bit more about one of uh, our audience members picked up on the idea that you said something along the lines of DSRP makes you a more active observer of reality or makes you interact with reality differently. And you talked about it being a mindful approach that avoids unintended consequences. And I think people would like you to expand on that idea. Like, what do you, what do you really mean by that? Sure. I will start a little bit from, from a different angle. I'm actually having, uh, and Laura, I think you know, I show it to you. I have DSRP in front of me because it's a tool for me to communicate with people as well, because I'm trying to understand their DSRP model. And I use sentences like, you know, this is my perspective, what's yours? Yeah. And, and, and the word triggers a, a, a different, you know, and, and for me, this is a distinct, distinct difference. I'm an electrical engineer. Electricity and mechanical are, you know, two sides of the coin. They are, they are very separated. I'm not sure how many people outside the engineering profession separate to that level. So th that's a personal experience. The more generic experience, when I looked at, and, you know, being an engineer, I look at loops, right? When I look at the DSRP and the relationship with reality, I realize that innovation happens also from this 
constant iteration between our perception of reality, our understanding, and we have an abstract understanding. That's what universities give us. We have a concrete understanding. This is when we touch and feel and, and work in the industries. And when we go through this cycle again, uh, we can see that uh, when we bring in a uh, system approach, a systematic approach, I should call it, we can see where the uh, opportunities for innovation are. And this is where middle managers and executives really get paid uh, is to continue to, to produce through innovation, right? It's, it's such a big problem. Right, right. No, that's great. We talk a lot about, and you probably remember from your systems thinking course, um, you know, that, that innovation is sort of born of relating to things that don't seem related, naming that relationship, articulating the parts of that relationship, and then you have a whole nother, uh, a new thing you brought into existence. And so I think people are really interested. I mean, one of the things that was great that you just mentioned, which we like to talk about, is you now have sort of a language among you and your colleagues for thinking. You know, you can you can stop and you can clarify, wait, maybe there's a difference between the distinction I'm making, what I mean by the word sustainability, and what you mean by the word. And one of your very first slides had on had one of the bullets said that it's been hard that that sometimes it's hard to get everyone on the same page. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how this new language of thinking and, and just incorporating systems thinking into your own work has maybe helped with that challenge of getting people on the same page, same mental model. I, I will. I'll get on my soapbox first. And in many corporate meetings, large corporate meetings with executives and decision makers, uh, you find somebody called the devil, uh, devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. And you find a person that uh, maybe the only mission in, or the only objective to be in the meeting is to say no or to negate. So this is really, uh, once you sort of, empirically develop this model of, of reality, uh, you prepare and, and you learn how to um, uh, start interacting with that person in advance. You don't go in an important meeting where a decision is made and you don't know who the players are. You don't know what their uh, intent is. So that's where the SRP sort of acts on an individual scale. I learned to uh, to go in and consult with these people and try to diffuse their uh, their uh, mindset, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and shift from negative to positive. And again, this is this is uh, this is very useful when you have a uh, a mental model of how other people operate. There are many mental models, you know. Uh, there are uh, Bono was known for wearing different hats in meetings, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. But these are about mental models. Uh, I, I really like a simply mental model because I'm, uh, I'm a si still a system engineer at heart. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a fair point. And there are a few, uh, I'm sort of gonna summarize across five or six questions that have come up, but people are really wondering how Mm, let's see if I can say this right. You've 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 looked at some things using sort of DSRP analysis or DSRP as a lens in relationship to sustainable practices, sustainability, and people. A lot of people are asking about how has this helped you identify the barriers that might be, you know, that you might face in trying to really increase sustainable practices, or how you would use. Um, this new way of thinking to deal with resistance to ESG. If they, if you have any ideas, you can offer to the uh, audience about that. How you would overcome those things? ESG, it's over politicized. At this point, I've seen um, people saying, "Let's not use ESG because it's poorly understood." As I started on my presentation, and, and it's all political coin, right? Uh, I, I noticed one comment is from uh, Canada, from Alberta. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, uh, of course, when your economy depends on on uh, fossil fuels, uh, it's an expected 
reaction from the politicians to preserve the status quo as much as they can. Uh, and DSG, it's an easy coin. You know, it's uh, it's it's easy. It's a three-letter acronym. Not many people even know what it is. Um, so actually, uh, this is this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm I brought this distinction, and that's where the SRP comes in. This distinction between sustainability and DSG, uh, and use it as a taxonomy. Because if 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 I say ESG and you say sustainability, and then we reverse and we argue about them, and we don't have a, even a simple baseline mental model what they are, then uh, we cannot um, resolve the ESG issue. Uh, in in the game, we, we have to uh, recognize reality. It is a political debate. It is a healthy debate, and let me say. Today's presentation helped me understand also that the transition is not a binary switch. And, and these were the previous uh, speakers ahead of me. It's not just a switch, you switch from uh, renewable to, there is a whole transition process. As I showed, huge, huge number of uh, people will, uh, will have to be requalified, reskilled, upskilled, or, or they lose their jobs because of this transition. Um, so I think engaging in, in correct political discourse, as opposed to ESG is bad, ESG is good, uh, will, uh, will, will have to be addressed really uh, head on. But my, my take is start with defining your terms before you argue. Yeah. <laughs> At least know what you argue about. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say... Taxonomies. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, our students and, you know, the... The executives we work with through executive education, I would say a majority of their problems and the failure of communication starts with an error in the distinctions they're making, meaning one group of people are all thinking the same thing, but calling it something different or vice versa, right? They're thinking different things and calling it the same. And, and I think, to be honest, starting your presentation with that simple distinction was a game changer because to me, up to now, most people think of those things as sort of highly related or almost synonymous one, with one another. But that distinction that you were able to make, I think has been very innovative to use. About 70%, according to a Fortune Magazine article, use it interchangeably. Yes. About two years ago. Yes. So, I, I, so, it's, so it's not clear in, in the person's mind. How can I argue or, or support? <laughs> Well, you'd, be argue. you'd be surprised people will argue <laughs> with oh no I, I'm, <laughs> I, right. i've been through my fair amount of arguments so uh, uh, based on misunderstanding and actually this is uh, this is what i'm saying i trans, trans i'm trans in the process of transforming myself from a system engineer because in system engineer the the world it tends to be binary this is yeah. where we have these experts right they know something that you don't know they, they have the acronyms that you never thought of mm -hmm. and, and they argue on that and you don't have even the basic understanding and this is the system thinking that pulls you back and says okay this person cannot make a distinction between sustainability and ESG so let's start there Let, let's not let's not argue about anything else what's your definition right. so at least I know how to adjust the conversation yeah. So that leads to my final question for you uh, that you've referred to the fact that you're an engineer transitioning to a systems thinker many times. And I, you know, our final speaker of the day today is actually the uh, former chair of the Department of Systems Engineering at West Point. And so I'm wondering, you've hinted that sort of the biggest thing has been that engineers are more binary. Um, are there other things that you have found challenging? about your engineering background when when trying to really become what you, I mean, you're obviously both because you are out, you Manuel are both, but what, can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, well, uh, first thing I'll refer to the education system, which is uh, monodisciplinary, if I can use uh, this, you know, <laughs> this relationship really. It's a single discipline. You go to engineering school and you study physics and mechanics and all, all these kind of things. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and nobody tells you about people and you become a manager and you manage people, you're not managing machines, right? Machines, you, you know a lot about machines, you know where the buttons are, but you manage yeah. people and nobody prepares you for that. So really I'll, I'll put the ball back into not only multidisciplinary and we talked today and yesterday about that training, but I'm talking to a, a professor from Canada and she talks about trans transdisciplinary. And transdisciplinary, the key difference, right? The key distinction is multidisciplinary are people of different disciplines in the same room. And transdisciplinary are people that communicate across their discipline barriers. Right. If I say electron as an electrical engineer, it means probably something quite different to a person that is a philosopher. Right, right. Well, I, you know, I can imagine we could talk for a very long time, but I'm going to have to thank you for your excellent presentation. And I hope you're going to stick around for the rest of the afternoon. We have some great things ahead of us. Definitely will. I'm all ears for, for the awesome. engineers. That's great.